All right, we are live. Hi, guys. Welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. I am Alan, and today, guys, today, I have an, a special treat. I have author Aaron M. Evans, who is author of Empire of Exiles, the first book in the book, Books of the Usurper, which is just an awesome name for a series, because oh, one, I love usurpers, and I'm glad that they have books. Um, anyway, <laughs> Aaron, thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. I read this book. I, I got an arc from, uh, from, from Orbit, and man, this book's good. This book is thank so good. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Yes, no problem. So let's 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 go ahead and get into it. So you, this is your is this your first novel outside of uh, TS Wizards of the Coast proper, properties? Right? Yes, this is my first original novel. This is my original debut, as they say, gotcha. which I still think is is sort of funny that I get classed as a debut. Not that I'm complaining because yeah. debuts do get a little extra oomph uh, yeah. when I have seven books out. Yeah, you've written seven <laughs> books in the Forgotten Realms, right? Yep. One, uh, the you have six of them in the Brimstone Angel series. Yep, six and... of them are the Brimstone Angel saga, and then my first book was in a series called Ed Greenwood Presents uh, Waterdeep. And, so that's a standalone. That's the Godcatchers. Yeah. Right. And mm -hmm. does, is that take which of which of your books deals with the the Sundering? Is that that's the adversary? That's the middle of the Brimstone Angel saga. I was it's I like was... a big crossover series. Yeah. Crisis crossover in the realms. I was when I was when I was researching that. I was like, the Sundering isn't that? Didn't I read books on the Sundering? Isn't that when like the gods were walking? And I'm like, Listen. and I had to look it up. I'm like, no, it's the time of troubles. Yeah, um, but the Forgotten Realms goes through this kind of stuff very regularly. So all it the is time. not. Yeah, this actually technically it's the second Sundering because there was a previous Sundering thousands of years ago in the past. Oh. Um, but all those, all the people that were around for the first Sundering are probably dead, so it's fine. Gotcha. So, and you worked for, for Wizards of the Coast, right? Yeah, for a little bit. Uh, I started there, I was an editor uh, on their novels line. I worked on the Eberron novels um, and a few of the Forgotten Realms novels because it was such a big property um, and a couple little cleanup things here and there. Um, but yeah, that was, that was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and that's sort of how I got, uh, the opportunity to write for them, write novels for them. Um, and, uh, and the rest is history. I love Eberron because I like Warforged. I don't know why I I'm Warforged. so attached to Warforged. They're like, really, there's such a cool, I had a, oh, not to be all like, let me tell you about my character. No, dude. But I have this, <laughs> I played Eberron. an Eberron game. I had this Eberron character that I loved and I wished there was some way to write a novel about her because I had a Warforged. I wanted something really bananas. I wanted a Warforged sorceress. Um, and so for people who aren't familiar with Warforged, they are basically like magic robots, except they're except not, right? So they're constructs created for this huge war that Eberron went through. Um, and they are sentient. And then there is this sort of question mark. Do they have a soul? Uh, and so I had, and so sorcerers, uh, have magic because in, at least at the time specifically, um, it was in their blood, right? Yeah. So you have this, there's been a lot of ways we've just kind of explained sorcerers, but at the time this was the case. So Luca was a warforged that appeared without memory, um, on the streets of the city of Sharn and was found by this halfling sorcerer who looked, they have these marks on their forehead that are distinct, looked at it, decided it looked like. Um, I think it was like a hand missing a finger and his young daughter had died in the war uh, after being tortured. And he decided this, you are the reincarnation of my daughter. And so he basically kind of brainwashed her into thinking she was a little halfling girl. So she's this huge war forged that really <laughs> believes deep down she's actually a little halfling girl. And so it was a lot of fun. It wasn't the right game for it because it was a very combat, like go from place to place kind of game. So like, oh, gotcha. you know, the first time that uh, one of our party members died and Luca couldn't cry. It freaked her out. But we were like, but the DM was like, oh, go up to the surface. So I was like, that was one of the first times I was like, I, you know, I like things about this world and this setting, but I do wish I could pull it into a novel set type of story yeah. because there are things that are appropriate at the table. There are things that feed the game. And obviously different games have different um, needs and, and uh, opportunities. Uh, but that was not what that game was for. Still, that's awesome, and every and every D and D nerd that just that is that is watching this is just <laughs> super excited because they're looking for someone to talk about D and D with too. Yeah. I'm glad <laughs> Warforge. They actually explicitly say that they don't take like they can't drown and they can't take poison mm -hmm. damage and all that stuff because yep. fourth edition left that. I argued with many people about. <laughs> 
I'm like, sorry, sorry. This adventure right here says that you take damage while you're underneath this river being carried down whatever away from this Lamia. And he's like, I'm a warforged. I can't breathe. I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you. You're drowning. Sorry. <laughs> it's getting into the into the interworkings of your ironwood. Yes, exactly. The ironwood. Now, guess what? Exactly. I said it's five ongoing rock damage. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Being hit on the on the, the rocks on the on the on the floor of the river. Anyway. Anyway. That's, uh, that's awesome. And um, so where did where, where did where did the books of the usurper come from? Because I'm I'm going to link it downstairs down downstairs down in the description, guys. You have got to check out the Twitter threads of. The extra world building for this, first of all, and I have them, I have them, oh, I have them ready. Hold on. I got to, oh man, I meant to, I meant to have this, um, uh, where the, sh there it is, share. I'm going to share. I have these images here because I was going to, you have got to check out these, like, look at this. First of all, look at this map. Look oh, at yeah. this. This is one of the most gorgeous maps I've ever seen in my entire life. It's amazing. How no, honestly, when they when they were talking about what their concept were was for the the cover, and they said we're thinking about doing a map, I was a little I was a little deflated. I was like, oh, a map, like because I'm picturing like a plain black and white map, and maps can be really really interesting. But like, what you want out of a cover sitting on the shelf is for it to be eye catching. Yeah, and I was like, okay, I, I you know I have to trust you, right? You're Lauren Panapinto. I have to trust you. Yeah. It's sort of inherent. Um, and then I saw the first pass on it. At, actually, be even before that, they introduced me to Francesca, uh, Francesca Barold, who's the the cartographer for this. And I went to her website and I was looking at her maps. I was like, oh my gosh, this is a totally different level of of map making. This is incredible. Um, it is amazing, and she was so you know, interested in what little details she could add um, and and what, what you know, what she could put in here that would bring out parts of the story. I feel so fortunate. Uh, uh, can't believe I ever uh, doubted for even a second. <laughs> it's incredible. That was the one downfall of reading it, of having the E arc instead mm -hmm. of um, an actual book. I did not have a map when I read it. Yeah. And the map would have enriched it so much more just like reading all that world building stuff is so freaking cool just knowing where because for i did not know that mm -hmm. samilla right here that I don't, people can't see my cursor never mind if you look over here <laughs> in the the left side you'll see samilla that's where that's the empire where everything takes place and you'll see a salt wall there i didn't realize how massive the world was outside yeah holy yeah. cow so that, that was a kind of a big part of the idea for the world is like, you know, like I like in, in fantasy worlds, I always love the, the place that's sort of the melting pot that everybody ends up in. Yeah. Um, and obviously when you do stuff like that, you have to consider things like, you know, are we playing into colonialist kind of ideas or, you know, why, why do people come here and how do they share um, culture and how do they hold on to their culture? And, and I was like, what if you just don't have a choice? What if you're just crammed in here yeah. um, and you have to make do? Uh, so yeah, I, I wanted to make a place that was, I, I have been, when I have been trying to think of distances, I have been assuming it's about like the Iberian Peninsula, um, give or take, because I'm not great at spatial stuff. So I'm glad I have people to check me on things where I'm like, it's to the south. And they're like, you said it was to the north three pages ago. <laughs> That's awesome. Like, okay. Um, <laughs> the, the map is freaking awesome. And all the different, like the world building in this, in this book is so freaking cool. Like it's so, yeah. and, and I don't want to say like, it's just the world building, like read this. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's an atlas. Like come read this, this history textbook, but no, some of my, m m many of my favorite uh, fantasy novels are ones that are kind of like, I guess, grounded in some kind of, they, they feel historical. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I mean, right now I'm reading a, uh, um, a book about that's, you know, similar to set in the, the, the Three Kingdoms, China. Um, okay. Because I, I, I mean, I like stuff that's 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 kind of grounded in there, and this feels a lot like that. Like I, I got, I caught, I caught the Byzantine influence, um, uh, for sure. And then some of these people's names, um, 
like the what was it is it Karatsi? Is that Karaj? Yeah, the, Kar the, the Karatsis is the yeah, thing, yeah. the Karatsis. I'm all I can think of is the Italian Renaissance like merchant princes. Um, even though Kiraj is, as you said uh, in your world building threads, Egypt or um, it's kind of a kind of late period Egypt meets Mesopotamia meets uh, Al Andalus, Spain. <laughs> Guys, other stuff. you have. I'm gonna link that Twitter, those Twitter threads. You have got <laughs> to go read them. And if you haven't, if you haven't read the book yet, if you've read the book, go read them. 100% enrich your experience. And if you haven't read the book, go read them and then go pre-order the book because you're gonna read them. And be like, I gotta read this book. Like, what's this book about? So, thank you. Where, where, where did this, where did this book come from? Where did the books of you surfer come from? Uh, so the where did they come from? It sort of started with I wrote another book. Um, after the novels program with uh, Wizards of the Coast uh, wrapped up, I was like, okay, I'm going to work on this epic fantasy idea. So I have this epic fantasy uh, that's sort of kind of like a bronze collapse. Uh, it's, I, I like it a lot, but it's also one of those things where you better be a big nerd because a lot of things turn on where there are tin mines and stuff. And here's the thing. This is when I discovered I count as a debut author because they're like, this is too long for a debut. And I'm like, excuse me? I'm not a debut. This is this is only a little longer than my longest book that I already sold. But that's a different thing because that's got an IP's uh, logo on it. So Who maybe this book will read come about Tin Mom. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> People don't understand. They don't. They don't get it. <laughs> it's very the Bronze Age collapse is very interesting, y'all. Um, but yeah, the uh, so I I spent I really that was a really rigorous kind of world building where I wanted everything to make like make a lot of sense. Um, and when I finished and I was I started quer the querying process before I realized this book is too dang long to start with. Um, I I was like, well, what do I want to do now? What do I need? Um, and there were a couple of things that um, that sort of popped up. And so. The, I had an idea for a magic system that felt like an anxiety disorder. So this is one piece, um, uh, which is kind of what the affinity magic is meant to, to sort of replicate. Um, I also, I, uh, I had read this story um, about uh, Lambert Simhill, the uh, Yorkist pretender. So uh, sort of, blah, 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 blah. this would have been, I guess, right after the War of the Roses. Um, these, these, these guys found this kid and were like, this is, this is one of the princes in the tower. He's survived. He's the king. Um, they took his kid to Ireland and they like crowned him and stuff. Um, and and that story made me think of the uh, the the idea for the grave spurned princess, like so having you know this poor kid sort of held up like here you go, um, but also like you know someone saying hey that's the answer. The kid who thought was dead is not dead. Um, and like your world building thread, you're like, yes, here, here she is. And no, you can't look at her. No, because... no you can't look at her. You might assassinate her. Exactly. We know what you did with the last one. Exactly. Um, the, uh, fratricide. and so then hmm? the fratricide, sorry. Yeah. The fat fratricide. I, I uh, love, love that guy. <laughs> Kill it's, everyone. Nice, it's a nice thing about giving people dramatic epithets is that it's I think easier to remember the fratricide than Apollino Illinetti, right? Uh it's sometimes it's easier to see the usurper. Although I think I think Rodolfo has enough presence that you're like, no, that's Rodolfo. Um <laughs> but love, so that was two. And then the other thing, and this is where I start to kind of like like sort of chuckle a little. Um, like I said, I, I was really rigorous about the world building on that epic. And so I was like, what do I miss from D and D? And I kind of miss the fact that in D and D there's a lot of stuff that's there cause it sounds cool and it doesn't make any sense. And so I kind of started making a Pinterest board of things I wanted. And there were, you know, I wanted, I was really drawn to that sort of Italian Renaissance feel. And, um, I started pulling in other pieces and I started coming up with this idea of a place. Cause I also really like that, that sort of mixture of cultures and that question of like, how do you sort of grow in a place where everything is so up cheek by jowl and how, do, how does, how does it change things? Um, and, and I started finding things that pictures that would get suggested to me cause they were fantasy that I was like, I like that. It doesn't make any sense but I will be taking it. Thank you. Um, 
and things like I missed, I missed my tieflings because I wrote that six book series is kind of became the sort of iconic tiefling story. And I missed the, my horned, my horned devil children. Uh, and I was like, you know, there is no uh, copyright on people with horns. So, okay, we have horizontal. <laughs> I have this, I don't know, I put these up there. I have this beautiful picture. I have, I actually, I have those here <laughs> to. Uh, There's my baby. Cause I wanted to yeah. um, make sure I could, I could show those. This, who did these, this artwork? So these are by Ivy Lee. Um, she is an artist that works for the same video com game company I work for. She does the, what we call the key art. So when a new character comes out, uh, she's one of the artists that does the sort of amazing portraits of them to sort of capture the feel and get people excited. Uh, so we Ooh. were actually in a meeting and I had been thinking about doing these and cause I, I just, I see people's pre-order swag i get people's pre-order swag sometimes and i love our cards and i was like i want i want to do this for even if nobody asks for them i want this for me um and then we were in a meeting and and there was a her key art for vecna because we had sort of a, a vecna themed freaking vecna freaking vecna <laughs> Stop I, moving I, your hand, it, bud. It is a it is a very the game the game I work on is is a it's an idle game so there's it's tied to D and D and it's it's oh. a little I mean it's a little silly because you've got characters from from all through D and D history mixed together and they just march across the screen and they fight the monsters but there's the story that goes along with it so it's kind of campy and douchebag Vecna is probably my greatest addition to this this he's he's absolutely the worst in, yes. in the in the adventures anyway so she had this art of vecna and it just looked amazing and it really reminded me of the portraits from like hate hades the video game and i was like man that's what i want that's what i want so i messaged her i was like I, ivy do you take commissions uh so she did three for me that are gorgeous and i'm hopeful i can get her to do another three for the next book i'm like kind of dreaming ahead and this is i before we went live, I, I meant yeah. to ask you how to pronounce the character's name. Just it's Eni. Eni. Okay, good. Eni. Eni Sixal Ulbaturin. Binturin. I can't say that either. Or just Eni. Eni. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to say Yinny. So nope. Eni. <laughs> Eni. And um, oh, I did it again. And then, boom, Quill. Yes. Esquilio Sepulai. His parents obviously, obviously don't like him very much with that name. But yeah, Quill, who is our, I, 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 you know, he's the, he's the main character. I, so I don't the, think he's the main character. See, okay, so this is, I don't disagree with you. I was a little like, Amadea is the main character, obviously. Oh, it's um, Amadea. Thank goodness. I got that one right. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I will say this is like, Quill is the one who kind of falls face first into the inciting incident. And, you know, I will, I will concede that marketing is probably right. That people like stories about, uh, you know, apprentices learning things uh a little more than you know kind of veteran uh uh established people with you know complex yeah. pasts uh trying to be really competent and but then Amadea, Amadea. these look these are so can you still get these if you pre-order or is it past yes. that point no oh. no no i i so i was like i am not going to be able to get everything and also get it out the door because I will be at World Fantasy uh, next weekend. So I'm like up until release, that's fine. And and honestly, there's also a chance I will look at the stuff I have left and go, I don't want to keep all of this and extend it again because I'm me. But it is, is still open. Good glass. Yeah, that's a little, that's a little glass sparrow. <laughs> like literally, I noticed it while we were talking. Holy us, oh, y'all read the book. I just, read the book. Yeah. So good. That's, I'm really that's pleased. Awesome. Who are the other three that you're going to get have done if you can? Well, okay. So for Relics of Ruin, which is book two, I ruin nice. Yeah, I want to get Richa. So my, 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 I actually, what I asked her for were these three. Um, and then I was like, if you have time, we could add on these. And unfortunately she was too busy to do more, okay. but uh, Richa, uh, who is sort of the fourth POV character, um, Rodolfo. And <laughs> then I wanted a Karimo. Uh, because I think having a sort of, you know, tragic Karimo card would be good. But uh, oh, Karimo oh, is... Oh, Karimo. Poor Karimo. Oh, I have to tell you. I knew you. you well, Karimo. Or not I, really, though. <laughs> I, I have a, 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 a 
well, I would say we're friends now, but it was a sort of internet acquaintance who uh, is a comic book artist who did some fan art of Brimstone Angel's characters. Um, and, you know, I po what happened was I posted the uh, picture of like the Dramatis Personae from the beginning on the Discord for my actual play show. And they all so like zoomed in on the last line of this, which is Bjorni, a horned rabbit skull. They're like, what is that? And so I clipped the scene uh, where Amadea comes in to talk to Tanook. And she's like, why is Bjorni in your room? And he's like, hey, you have a pet. Why can't I? And Jorge went and drew it. Like he drew that scene, which is also in one of the Twitter threads. And so I asked him, I'm like, he's like, I'm so excited for this book. And I can't wait to draw things from it. I was like, can I send it to you? And so I sent him one of my ARCs. And uh, he immediately started drawing things, which was very exciting. But he, he, uh, so he didn't read any of the cover copy stuff. And he's like sending me so many pictures of Karimo. Uh, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> do I tell him? Um, but what came out of that was uh, when <laughs> it turns out Karimo dies, uh, he did a really sort of beautiful picture of that moment. And I was like, can I? can I buy this from you? And can you make it into something I can use for pre-order? And he was very excited. So he did this great piece that I also have put on Twitter to show people um, that the center stripe is a bookmark and then it will be in different sizes for various wallpaper. If you would like a picture of a tragic murder on your wallpaper, yes, which yes, I have I been assured. I was going to say, every time I say that, at least one person's like, I do. Well, and for the for the, the the spoiler crowd, guys, it happens in like, it's like in the first chapter. It's, yeah, it's kind of it's, mentioned in the cover copy. That, yeah, so. exactly. It's, you know, look, any people watch my channel, they know like if it would be in the trailer for the movie, it's yeah. it's not really like a spoiler. It's it's it's. I said it in my review, so if they if they watch <laughs> if they watch my review, deal with it. Um, but that so th there's this book is so is is very different. Like first of all, the fact that there were archivists. Um, I was like, I love scholar characters. Um, I don't think there are enough scholar characters, mostly because they can't do anything. They just stand around and, you know, they're the people that, they're the secondary characters people go to for lore. Like, we need an answer. And, you know, they got their dusty tones. And what if the whole book was about finding answers? Yes, I know. <laughs> so that's anyway. actually another thing. When I was thinking about it, I was like, you know what else? I love mystery novels. Yes, who done novels. it? Right, right. I'm like, I, you know, I've read, I think, I went through a phase where like all I read was cozy mysteries in college um, to the point where I got too good at the structure <laughs> I had oh, to no. stop, right? Because you're like, oh, okay, it's that guy, but I'm going to think it's that guy. <laughs> um, I've read every Agatha Christie. I, I mean, like, yeah, no, I love it. I love the puzzle. And I, even with fantasy novels, like my preference is for something that is about characters trying to figure out what's going on on some level like what is happening in the world or what is this problem in front of us or why isn't this working the way we expect those are my favorite kinds of stories and that I think naturally combines with a mystery with a whodunit kind of thing but you can also add weird magic into it which you know I know Joyce Carol Oates very loudly said that's not allowed but I disagree uh <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about the magic system here in a minute because the magic system also too. But add the add mystery and archivist and then a failed coup with a usurper. And look, I'm in. I'm sold. Like I love, <laughs> love coups and revolutions. Um, and so this book is there was a, a failed coup by the mm -hmm. the the protectorate, um, the Duke of Kiraj, right? Mm -hmm. Rodolfo. Yep. Uh, we're using the grave spurned princess. That he found and was like, "Hey, the fratricide killed all his royal people. Missed one. Yeah, like you missed this one. Like, let's just put this one on the throne." And and then he had, and th that's another character that's that I attached to G Gaspera. Is that her name? Mm -hmm. Like, she's awesome. <laughs> she, she betrays the empire by joining. And this is, guys, this is all backstories. This is. This this is all stuff that happened before. She betrays the yeah. empire while jo to join with Rodolfo, then betrays Rodolfo. Yep. And she's that's definitely, definitely a fair weather friend. <laughs> she, she's awful, but I love her. Like, I don't know. I like her a lot. I, 
I like I charismatic know. characters you would not want to be friends with in real life. Those yeah, are some oh, of my sure. favorites. For You're sure. like, I love reading about my my best friend um is absolutely loves Nanki, uh, who's one of the other suspects in yeah. this. Um and and <laughs> she's like, maybe you could just maybe show up more, more of him. But I'm like, he's terrible though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's 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 just it's 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 so it's so good. So so the the the, the coup fails, and mm -hmm. he's each part of the the book deals with. We get to see Rodolfo, and it's like a scene with Rodolfo and his brother. But it's from yeah. each, it's from varying perspectives from the beginning. Like the opening of this book is so good from his um from Rodolfo's younger brother's perspective, mm -hmm. and it's written differently than the rest of the book, and. Oh man, it yanks you in right there. It ended, and I'm like, okay, hold on, wait, wait, what? Where's where's the next Rodolfo chapter? And I was so happy when I got through part one yep. and saw another <laughs> Rodolfo chapter. I'm like, oh, another Rodolfo chapter. Yay. That part, I, love. I loved those sections. And what is happening in those sections? I'm like, this is cool backstory. And then by the end, I'm like, oh, <gasps> there were important things happening. <laughs> I need to go back and reread them. That is that is that is my favorite when I can do that. When it's like um, so you're absorbing stuff as you go along, but then you know, if especially uh, you know, my dream is always write a book that you want to read a second time, and then on the second read, you realize all new things. Yeah. Um, that there's stuff there that maybe you picked up on a subconscious level, but you weren't really aware of. And then when you go back, you're like, oh, this was here from the start, yeah. uh, but it didn't announce itself. I didn't know. Um, that's a nice feeling. I feel like, like when you make, when you write something, especially if you write something, somebody wants to read again, because there's sure. so many books out there. <laughs> that's like, you know, that's when I hear that, that's high praise when someone does that. So oh, it's, it is excellent. It is excellent. And then, so then we flash forward past the coup old Rodolfo's getting hanged. Sorry, bud. That made me so sad. I like Rodolfo. Um, <laughs> and then, so we've got Quill, our, mm -hmm. our um, Scrivener, who mm -hmm. is, they are monk bureaucrats. Yeah, they're basically like a juridical order. They're like quasi-religious order. Um, I liked the idea that this empire, it's, and, and I want to be super clear, I don't think any of this would work in real life. Uh, this is not me advocating <laughs> for a governmental system in any way. Uh, but I liked the idea, you know, you have all these people come together and you're trying to kind of fit some, cobble something together. And so if you have these like sort of non-governmental organizations, like, hey, you know what? Uh, we were really good road builders, right? Um, man, I forget who the really good road builders. I want to say the Jatangu were really good road builders. Also the Persians. Yeah, for real. <laughs> But yeah, having like, you know, hey, you know, we could do this. Like, for example, you know, the the sort of um, emergency services is the the vigilant kinship of Mother Ayemi um, or the kinship of vigilant Mother Ayemi. I honestly wrote it both ways. So I will have to check the copy editor notes to make sure I know what I'm saying. But at any rate, like so this came from uh, the Empire of Bemina. Uh, they had this this group and they what they would do, you know, it grew out of the military and it's like, OK, it's sort of peacekeepers and it's also firefighters. Um, and then you merge that with, hey, you know, erosions are real good with, uh, you know, like psychological care. Right. So this fits together. We're trying to make sure that everything runs smooth. So we have this organization and they like fundamentally do answer to the government, but they also operate almost like. You know, like like I was thinking a lot of the Catholic Church in medieval times where it's like this is fulfilling the role of a government in a lot of ways and it's impacting your life in a lot of ways. And if we were to sort of split that up into lots of different things, what would that look like? So there are these, you know, vocations you go into where you kind of swear an oath and you say, I'm going to do this job for the rest of my life or until I take the, you know, go through the rituals to, to leave it um, because it was an interesting idea. Yeah. Also, I just wanted to call his boss a primate. It was like primate Lamberto sounds cool. That's look, look. It is, <laughs> it is. And, and I, I forgot to, to give people the context of why all of these people, all of these disparate nations, are crammed into this one, uh, this you know, this the one empire of uh, of Samilla, right? Because they've all been chased in there. That's why it's Empire yeah. of Exile because they're all exiles. Yeah. The, the changelings 
chased them in. Yeah. So this was like uh, the idea of like, how do you get, how do you get a tiny little pocket empire full of uh, a bunch of different people? Well, there's a catastrophe, right? And so, um, yeah, the idea I came up with was there are these sort of shape-changing creatures and they can look like anybody. And so they, what they do is they cause uh, civilization collapses in various ways. Um, and if you were, you know, a civilization that was already having a kind of rough go of it, that's the perfect time for uh, for them to step in. And no one really knows why they did it. They don't know where they came from. This is like the boogeyman of, yeah. of everybody. Um, and what they know is like when that starts, you got to get out. Um, so basically they just, it's, you know, it's, they, you read stories of like the Mongol horde or something. And so this idea of this sort of like this army, you don't know how to fight sort of sweeping in, but by the time they're all in Simila, everybody has a little bit of information and they can kind of put it together, work together. And they, uh, come up with the salt wall. Uh, so the changelings definitely have kind of a fey vibe to them. They don't like salt. They don't like iron. Uh, they don't like being cold. Uh, I don't know if that's a fairy thing. I am, but they, it's so cold they, iron and, you know, does it cold iron? Or... Well, they're not fairies, so it's fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they're changeling. Right. So, so yeah, so they make this, uh, they, there are these, these sorcerers that, so they, they, that's, that's, that's when we get into the magic system, I guess. Look, the salt um, wall is, the salt wall is awesome. Like from the first <laughs> time I read about the salt wall, about how sorcerers like let themselves you know, be consumed by their power so they could turn into salt wall, a wall mm -hmm. of salt and iron. And iron. Right? <laughs> but, but an iron wall is less cool than a salt wall. It's like, more salt than iron, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Suck it, changelings. Just, just uh, you know, if they ever figured out like a high-powered hose would get through this, they'd hit the iron and they go, oh, new plan. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Although it's magical salt, so I, I, I have just sort of said- That's true. Hand but wave, the, hose it just, the hose would rust the iron. Rust it back up. So yeah, that's when you get arrows. Just pick them off. It's there fine. you go. <laughs> <laughs> I will say about the chain about changelings and yeah. just dealing with changelings and the idea of changeling and all that stuff. I so I oftentimes find myself I don't like shape shifting anything because mm -hmm. it can be so easily like oh and it was me the whole time you know like, <laughs> yeah. You know, I am going to say that dealing with change, anything dealing with the mythos of uh, changelings or anything in here is done so well. Like, well, thank you. It's such a, such, it's, there is no, guys, there's no, there's no Scooby-Doo, like I'm ripping my mask off. Uh, it was old man Smithers the whole time. <laughs> no, like I, I don't know. There's a lot of cool stuff. Like there's a lot of stuff. There, there's, there's, there's one scene that, I mean, it may uh, I'm just getting another stuff. There's a scene somewhere in the book that I was just like, that's disturbing. Why? This is a really, this is very disturbing. <laughs> I'm so and curious what it is, but it sounds like it's a deep different enough way in. than I anticipated. I will, I will tell you, <laughs> okay. I'll tell you when we, when we go off live, I'll tell you. Okay. When. It was, I was like two things happened that I was not prepared for, but anyway, so, so anyway, so changing stuff is cool. And then the magic system. So tell us about the magic system. So the magic system, the main magic system is that people have, uh, uh, people who have the magic have a connection to a worked material. Um, so this is, there's like a big spectrum. So there, you could be someone who's like, like, oh, I'm a ceramic, I have a ceramic affinity. So like when I make cups, they don't, they don't break when they fire. They're, they're perfect. Or, you know, maybe they just break less because I'm not that strong. Um, when you develop enough of an affinity that you, uh, for example, work in the Imperial Archives, um, you can sort of communicate with that with that material. So you can tell like what is in it and what's it made of and is it starting to break down anywhere? Um, and that you sort of have a, it's almost like you can talk to it in its language, right? Um, and and the, the sort of further up that sort of, that curve you get, um, you get up to where you've sort of become defined as a sorcerer. Um, and sorcerers sort of like perpetually exist because it, the, the other thing of the affinity magic is that I wanted something that sort of cycled, right? That like sometimes you like, you kind of weren't feeling it. Like I go like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a mug. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes you're just super in tune with it. Um, for sorcerers, they're always completely in alignment with their with their material. And not only that, they can sort of like 
call things to the material. Um, so in the book, there's a character that's a sorcerer that 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 was involved with the coup, Fistrata of the Glass. And so Fistrata can um, manipulate glass, but she can also take like sand and make it into glass, um, which is and then and then at the same time, like once you kind of get to that level of connection, like she understands glass better than she understands people, really. Yeah. So having Rodolfo say, why don't you make an army out of glass for me? She's like, that sounds like a fun project. Yeah. Uh, I don't really care about what's good, what you're going to do with it. I just want to see what happens. Um, oh, oh, Rodolfo. <laughs> I stand Rodolfo. I love him so much. Very convincing. It's, uh, it's, and, and it, the, and when, the, when they get out of control, they, yeah. they, they spiral. And then that's when like, the material kind of takes over. Yeah, they like it's the the idea kind of with the spiral is like they lose the border between themselves and the material. Um, so they, you know, there's a scene in here where one of the archivists spirals and she sort of starts kind of trying to pull that material sort of into herself and it it's starts kind of like one, right? the bronze one, yeah. And so she, the thing there is like she that boundary has broken. And, and so she can't sort of define where she is and where the bronze is and where that gets dangerous is, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, things that your human body needs <laughs> that, that aren't bronze, that aren't bronze. Um, and that, you know, if she were to sort of just keep pulling it sort of into herself, you know, she'd seal herself off. Um, and it's, you know, that, that you get to a place where you, you can't define where you, then this is sort of where we get into like, how is it like, how is an affinity like an anxiety disorder, right? right? There's a point, you know, if you have an anxiety disorder, there's a point where you think like all the thoughts I'm having are very logical. This is how, this is just how brains work. And, and it is hard in that moment to step back and go, actually this thought pattern is a maladaptive process that I've built for myself and I need to separate it away from me. Um, and so that's what I kind of wanted with the alignment is where if, you know, you fall into this, this pattern and you get into this place where you can't define the boundary anymore and you don't want to. Yeah. Right. And so having in the archives, you know, you have people who are powerful enough that this happen is more likely to happen to them. And so it's almost like part, part smithsonian part group home yeah uh because so they have like people that work there who also still work with all the artifacts and stuff but part of their job is to just kind of keep an eye on the specialists and help and that's, them that's amadea, manage right? it that's amadea yeah. yeah amadea is uh you know sh her her job is to basically make sure everybody is like taking care of themselves and if they can't that she's there to step in um, and also to do things like translate texts and yeah. uh, <laughs> make sure that the fabricators aren't cheating them when they fix the cold magic panels and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> Amadeus, great. Um, and, yeah, right. and I will say, when when they when the character when the character is spiraling, I love the way that you write their thoughts. Like you can you can feel the bronze and then the ink like taking over mm -hmm. like the way they think it's it's really good it's one of the things that I, that absolutely stood out to me um it's really really good thank you so so yeah the magic system is so cool like it's so <laughs> cool like reading that like this ink this ink is made of this particular thing and dying. you can make ink out of so many things i do, can't tell you i did a lot of research about ink <laughs> oh man that must have been First it was all, interesting because I was like, can you, just, can you just burn stuff and put it like in water? Yeah, but actually better stuff, you know, lamp black and oil and scraping it off of, you know, smelting kilns and stuff like that. Smelting, also interesting. Very Look, interesting. People, people need to be more <laughs> interested in like logistics and like <laughs> the, the minutia of I, stuff that, that goes into worlds. I think honestly, like, I mean, you can't, I feel like it, it is, it is a, a, a tough road to hoe to, to try to convince people to care about all of these kinds of things in one place, but like being able to take like a, like a slice of it yeah. and, and, and get them to care about it by having characters that care about it mm -hmm. is I think a lot of fun. So. And, and that's one of the, that's one of the strengths of this book is the ensemble cast. Like none of them really feel like they get left behind. Oh, and, <laughs> 
and their relationships are a, a lot of what a lot of what sells it. Like I cared about all of them. For so Quill, Quill could easily have have annoyed the crap out of me. But I love, <laughs> I love the fact that everyone is sitting around there. Everyone's talking about implications. Right. And Quill's just like, hey, but what if we found out who murdered my friend? What if we did that instead? Hey, guys, guys, what are y'all doing? Like, what if we went and did this? No, I don't want to do that. I want to go talk to this person. They're like, you can't. Right. That'll cause an incident. Let's go talk to them. Like, Quill, <laughs> he, is, he is determined that these people are going to investigate what he wants them to. Yeah. I love Quill. Like, yeah, like he lost somebody that he was super close to that yeah. also I think in a lot of ways that he's not I don't know that he ever actually articulates it in the book but it's definitely my intent that he felt very like on the one hand he felt Karimo protecting him but he was also protecting Karimo back yeah. you know he's like the ultimate wingman and he's like gonna help make sure that Karimo gets um you know, like succeeds in his life because, you know, he looks at his past and goes like, I've been super fortunate, but you haven't. Yeah. And I'm going to do, I'm going to make sure the world does right by you. And then it goes horribly wrong. And, yeah. and so it's like, you know, there's a penance to his like dedication to this case, like on top of the fact that he just needs the world to make sense again. Yeah. But yeah, everybody's like, okay, however, yeah, however. <laughs> you're not the only person here. Yeah. What about things that affect things besides you, Quill? He's like, I don't care. Let's can we please go find it out? And then, and then he'll leave, and then he comes back in a huff because he's like, I, I need help. Please don't help me. You know, please help me. And then so you, then you've got speaking of the the specialists and the magic, Yini, 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 who is the? She's definitely not a tiefling. She is an Orazandi. She's right? Orazandi, yeah. Orazandi. They have mm -hmm. the horns. They do and have four. They have like sacred charms hanging from them. Yeah. And a third eye. They can see and in the dark. And a third eye. Yeah. They can see in the dark. They have a parietal eye. So like right there in the bone. The picture, I will say the, the picture that we flashed, like this is like an artistic rendering. And I I like it because I have to admit, once you start trying to draw a third eye on something, it it's very difficult. To it make looks it look weird. Good. Yeah. It looks weird real fast. So I like this, but um, I definitely was imagining it because there's like a, there's a, a, a a fuse in your skull there uh between your parietal bone and it's like right in there and it's uh, it, you know animals that have this can sort of see like shades of black and white but i decided they have basically infrared vision so she can see uh like heat signatures uh with it uh because they live partly underground and so if you're kind of thumbing around in caves you probably don't want to set a lot of fires uh just to see and they don't have the magic lights that i made up so i don't have to answer to why are there candles all around all this flammable stuff uh so they can see in the dark because i think it's cool oh good point you can't have candles around all of these <laughs> well, ancient texts you know, that are dry as a I, I really love fantasy but at, at this point i get so like worn out thinking of things like how do they turn on the lights like it's such a natch or like the one that that I had to really fight with because D&D has a spell uh, called sending. So you can like send a message that's 25 words or less. Yeah. And I've used it in books <laughs> and it's kind of fun, right? Because you have to figure out the 25 words your character is going to say. And then somebody gets upset and they try to say more than 25 words and it's great. It's like an old and, speak text. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and it, because you so get so used to, okay, yeah, you're on the other side of the continent, but of course I can talk to you. And you have to break your brain of that. Like, no, you can't. Yeah. Right. You can't just bust out sending every time you want a character to be able to tell someone there's tension in the fact they can't talk to each other mm -hmm. and you created it self. So work with it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. turning on the lights is, is absolutely my least favorite thing. Cause it's like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get into, and then we lit the candle and I don't want to create a situation where readers are like, she didn't explain how they lit the candle because oh. that's not interesting. Yeah. So I, I, I am a big fan of magic lights. <laughs> agree. I completely agree. So, so Amy here is yes. an ink specialist. Yeah. Which is not a normal Orizondi specialist, specialized no. specialization. No. Yeah, her her great aunt is the uh, the Reza of the Ulben Turin, which is sort of like a like a clan leader, um, and uh, she would really she's very so so for the Orzandi the, the affinity magic is holy, 
Um, sorcerers are saints. They are considered a conduit between the God above and the God below and people. Um, and they venerate the saints, uh, particularly once they're dead, but also when they're alive. However, there are no Orizondi saints right now, so that doesn't we don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, but uh, yeah, her, her, her intro scene is her sort of sitting with her great aunt who's like, maybe has anybody checked to see if you are actually only reacting to bone black inks and you are actually a bone specialist because that is a traditional thing. And she's like, I don't think that's the case. Can we please stop dinner now? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so that that causes some tension for her because she's, you know, the for Amy in particular, like she's the like like one of the things that I wanted here and and that I've kind of reiterated through this the whole process is like, you know, we have this big world map. Nobody in this book has ever been to any of those places, so you know there there are things that are traditionally Orizondi because you know the Orizondi. Um, they, my thought is they have sort of like a cuneiform kind of writing. So it's, it's impressions in, into clay. So they don't use ink in particular. So they don't develop ink affinities, but a hundred years later, and Eni's only ever been, you know, you know, she probably ha does have interaction with that, but also they have almost certainly learned how to recreate that with ink because that's, you know, oh, okay, paper is very accessible and now we're going to do things this way. So we've adapted some. And so Eni develops an ink specialty and an ink affinity. And so that feels wrong to to the Reza because that's not something that Orizondi do. But at the same time, what Orizondi do is different now. And so for Eni, like this is something that is really important to her, but at the same time, she's getting this message that it shouldn't be. Um, so she's caught very much in between uh, what what is expected of her and also what she wants, uh, which just kind of keeps ramping up. <laughs> yes, she's so nice. She's a little. She's sweetie. <laughs> she's, she's very nice. Everyone, everyone will 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 want to protect her. They will be they will be very mad if you do bad things to her. <laughs> and the the Orizondi have freaking like every time i was like this thing's cool like so, another cool thing would come they venerate the bones of their saints that so their saints which are the sorcerers right turn yeah. their bones turn into their yeah so when a, when a sorcerer dies they're they're like their flesh transmutes um, which you can see in the book when you when you do meet because you do meet Fistrata at one point and Fistrata had her leg destroyed um, by a bombard by like a cannon blast and so you know that kind of all turned to glass uh, so she just kind of pulled it all back together and she has this glass leg that she can kind of reform or like she has a scar and the scar is sort of filled with glass because this is this sort of dead flesh has has transmuted um so when they die they're which i i recognize if you're a bone sorcerer it's got to be real weird if all the rest of you turns to bone but your skull skeleton stays i don't know guys i haven't written that yet so i don't know how that looks but uh but yeah so the skeleton remains and the the orizondi uh as a culture sort of practice excarnation so they you you know leave it out get the the flesh off and then you recollect the bones that are left um and for saints they sort of excarnate themselves <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so then they decorate them and i got this idea from uh the catacomb saints in europe and the amazing book heavenly bodies by paul kudonaris uh where you have these um these catholic churches collecting the skeletons of purported martyrs um like and decorating collections right when they were yeah yeah well okay. it's so bananas oh it you this book i loved so much i couldn't stop talking about That's it to anybody because it was such a cool small. idea because it's like, yeah, the Reformation um, and, and sort of the some of the Protestant arguments where relics are creepy and and they have this whole you know conversation about like, well, what are we going to do? And about the same time, they discover this catacomb full of early Roman Christians. And they're like, you know, some of these seem like they're martyrs. And they're like, what if we just went harder on the relics? 
No, and so that's the had, bad, that's a bad decision. Why do they? But do you that? get these amazing, these amazing <laughs> things where you have like these whole skeletons, and you have like there are particular abbeys of nuns that would like specialize in creating the ornamentation for them, and then they're posed in the churches, and there's this big deal, and it becomes so popular that they're like raiding catacombs and making new saints up. Yes. And, and, yes. and it's, it is so interesting and weird to see. And it was huge. And then, yeah, like all of a sudden it kind of dropped off. They were just suddenly like everybody looked up and went, maybe this is a little creepy. Uh, but, I first yeah. learned about that. I saw a play, <laughs> like a humorous play that was about that. About like, Oh, yeah? Yeah. It's, it's called Incorruptible by Michael Hollinger. And it's about, they just start making up. up. They start making up. Like yeah. finding anything they oh we got relic. Oh, look at this is a relic. They start making crap up. Right. And I it was, was like, wild. Yeah, I was like, this can't be real. Like, this cannot be a real thing. And I look it up, I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is this is a and real <laughs> thing that was occurring. <laughs> I loved reading the like the examples for that of like what the like, oh, this is a martyr. Cause it would be like, oh, there's a palm leaf, palm leaf is a sign of martyr, it's martyr. There's an M. Is it for Mori or Memento? It's probably for martyr. It's definitely uh. for martyr. <laughs> <laughs> It's great. I love too that you'd get ones where it's like, wait, you have St. Pancratius? We have St. Pancratius. It can't exactly. be two St. Pancratius. <laughs> it's a like miracle. Martyr fever. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a miracle. We, they, 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 it duplicated somehow. Anyway. So, yeah. So, part of the archives is the Chapel of the Skeleton Saints where yes. uh, they're all in there. It's cool. And you've got the one dude who, when you can't get their skeletons, he makes them out of wood. Yeah. St. Kilbat of the Cedar. She made uh, she made duplicates of them all. So, oh, so it wasn't there. just one dude, this one There's lady. One. Yeah. yeah. Well, dude can be. <laughs> I call everybody. Yeah. Dude. Makes, stop, the, makes, but... makes, makes them out of wood. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, yeah, because that's another thing is like, you know, people fled with the things that were important to them, but the reality is you're never going to grab everything. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on what was going on, maybe you couldn't. So I don't remember the exact numbers, but like maybe a third or a quarter of the saints are. Well, are the wooden. salt one is the, the saint. Yeah. Um, oh, and St. Asla. Yeah, she's in the wall. Mm -hmm. So there's. So they clearly yeah. don't have hers. Mm -hmm. Uh, I assume she's got her own kind of chapel, although we have not gone there. Actually, the 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 saints are going to be real important in Relics of Ruin. So, Relics of Ruin is coming out like December, right? A year. <laughs> no, I'm still finishing it. Oh dang! <laughs> oh my god, I would die if it was not December. <laughs> I thought you were releasing one a month. That's what I no, heard. No, no, not quite. Oh uh, yeah, no. There's a yeah. It turns out there's a skeleton in the chapel that's supposed to be wood and is not. <laughs> I have to go reread it like now. Have I? That's in the next book. That's in oh. the Relics of Ruin oh. that they they realize that one of the skeletons that's uh, for for I you know and I it's in the there's a there's the first chapter in here. Who knows if this will be not in mine? Chapter. I didn't have the first not chapter in, in my yours. E I'm sorry, my e arc. but yeah. I, I pre ordered it. So when I get the uh, oh, yeah, um, okay, so that's where it ends. Which I hope Amazon does what it's supposed to do. Amazon has the last two books that have released, I pre ordered, yeah. and I got one of them two and a half weeks after release. I still haven't gotten one that released on all on October 5th. Oh. I don't know what's going on. Um, I'm sorry, that sucks. But I will definitely read that first chapter when I get it. And so now, what about Amadea? So Amadea is like, character. she's like the ultimate mom friend. Uh, she's, <laughs> so she's a, she's what's called an archivist superior. She is basically the manager of the archives uh, for the, um, the Southern Wing. Uh, she's like hyper competent and, and, uh, so, so when, when things go wrong, um, so obviously Quill, Quill comes to the archives to, uh, to basically get some artifacts for, uh, for actually for the current Duchess Karazzi, right? And so everybody's sort of like, yeah, Karazzi's caused problems. Why are you getting these things? Um, but, uh, so he comes for that reason, you know, uh, it's, and, and in the process of it, he sees her um, help 
uh, a couple of the, the specialists that are starting to hit their alignment and getting kind of feisty. And Eni says to him, Amadea is the one you want in a crisis. So when a crisis hits, Quill comes back and is like, I've heard you're good at this. Um, <laughs> yeah. So she's, uh, she is kind of helping. She's, she's the grown up in a lot of ways. However, she's also got a lot of stuff she has not dealt with in her past um including you know she she was actually uh acquainted with uh the karatsis through uh through the son of rodolfo so that's a mess uh so she bramo right bramo yeah who's married to the empress now <laughs> yeah, yeah he's the he's the prince consort right mm -hmm. yeah I'm trying to keep all the titles straight and <gasps> The cool, I really like the cool thing with the imperial family, how they have different masks for, like, <laughs> if I'm wearing a black mask, you yeah. can't like either John Cena, you can't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. I'm so, glad you like that. Cause I was like, is this silly? I don't know. Cause I wanted them to have like some kind of weird taboos that they also held on to that, you know, like, or, I think early on when Quill talks to one of the, um, one of the people he meets on the street and they're like, they're like, I'm not, I mean, I literally just saw that. Like, yeah. let's not be silly yeah. here. But yeah. there is this sort of culture expectation that if, you know, the what kind of mask they're wearing tells you how you're supposed to interact with them. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually had a scene I had to cut where, uh, which involved uh, two of the archivists, Stavio and Bijan, uh, who are married to each other. And they were out with Quill and Bijan, it turns out, is like, that the, the masks are sort of like the the queen's brooches like she wears a particular mask to send a particular mess or a particular brooch to send a particular message right um or she did uh and so in the same way the empress will choose a mask and there's like you can read into it based on what she chose and so the, there's this whole sort of like subculture of people who are very into like you know assessing the masks and they know all the masks and stuff but uh that was you know this is one of the things about having a mystery plot is that you have less of the fun and games time uh <laughs> so you had to you had to cut the scene about them talking they're talking with the with the the i don't know the gossip purveyors or whatever yeah like well uh, for that was like i think it was a version where uh, when they when they were going and sort of trying to talk to some of the Quill was trying to go talk to some of the suspects, he brought Bijan and Stavia with him, um, and so it ended up having to kind of everything had to get a little tighter to get through the the mystery in a nice clip. Uh, so maybe later we'll find out about Bijan's. Uh, maybe maybe we'll be able to work it in as a very important detail. Um, Bijan's uh, encyclopedic knowledge of the the Empress's masks. That's awesome. <laughs> Who is the bronze specialist that hates Stavio? Zofia. Yeah. <laughs> I love these two. So one of the things with the with the specialists too, like there, I, like there is admittedly a lot of characters in this, although my hope is that they are introduced in such a way that you're not totally flooded. And you do have that character list if it is too much for you personally. Um, and one of the times early on, it was like, do you need all of these archivists? And I'm like, yes, I do. Because there are sort of like things you know about the system based on who's there. So you have two bronze archivists. There are actually like over a dozen bronze archivists in the archives, but you know Stavio and, and, and Zofia. And there are things about them that are similar and there are things that are different. And what I love about them is that they fight like cats and dogs, right? But at the same time, when she's in the spiral, he's two floors up going, tell me she's okay. Tell me she's okay. Yeah. Like they are like brother and sister in, in all the ways. <laughs> but they're like, yeah, when you meet them in this book, they are both like in the peak of their power. They're both like on edge and they are like ready to murder each other for a lot of it. Um, and yeah, he, uh, he calls her Sorcha, which in... Uh, Ashtabari means witch. Uh, but then, you know, when he's when they start to calm down, he's also calling her Odidono, which means little sister. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that I like I liked that uh that interaction between them. Like she was she was not having any of Stavio. She is not no. gonna let him be the one to <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm gonna do it. Yep, yep. And so Amadea is very I, I think Amadea is the main character in this. Like I think I think I I'm a disagree. Dance. She's definitely one of the ones I started with. Like I knew I wanted, um, I knew I wanted a woman who is you know older and really competent and like really sure of what she was doing. Um, and I wanted, I also wanted sort of a mentor mentee relationship. And so 
um, you know, that's what I envisioned for Quill and Amadea is sort of like she's kind of showing him this other kind of experience and 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 helping him in ways and as he's helping her. Um, and so, yeah, watching, having them sort of figure each other out is a big part of this story. Um, so, yeah. I think I think Eni is is like it's Amadan and Eni and then I mean Quill's, Quill Quill also. But, <laughs> but, but I think the, the uh, those two are I mean it's it's an ensemble cast like it really is. And then we haven't talked about Risha, right? Risha, yeah. Risha. Risha. Risha's like the cop. Oh my God. Is it? Yeah, he's the one. With, I I I joke that Risha's job is safe because he's the one with the keys to the morgue. Uh, that you need you need someone who can get to the sort of if you're doing a when you're doing a mystery you kind of need someone who's got the the inside information because mm -hmm. otherwise uh, you have to make up a letter because I, I will tell you this in the first uh, draft of this um, that my agent uh, uh, offered well she she offered me an R and R with it and one of the things she said was because um, Richard didn't have a point of view uh, he was a non point of view character and she was like this is making Quill's story a little hard to follow because he was basically having to go everywhere with Richa. And so he, you know, needed to care a lot about this crime, but then he was the one who was having to do all this sort of like detail work. And I was like, Oh, that is actually really the problem that I didn't see. Um, so Richa, we got a point of view. So yeah, he is a, um, a member of the vigilant kinship. Uh, he is, you know, kind of, kind of a cop firefighter, uh, emergency services guy. Um, for this, mostly he's a detective, uh, and he, yeah, he is the one sort of uh, initially looking into this this sort of murder suicide that that is rapidly not making sense as a simple thing, um, and he, yeah, he's the one with the keys to the morgue. <laughs> yeah, and he's he's not gonna like you. You're getting too close. Get off the case. He's no, he's not gonna no. do it. He's not gonna do it. No, he's gonna stick with it because he took an oath. He took I an love, oath. I love, I love the dog and detective. I love, I love <laughs> one of my favorite characters in all of fantasy is uh Terry Pratchett's commander Samuel Vimes of the yeah, Night Watch. That's a good one. Yeah, and so any I like I I can't not, even if I set out like I'm this time I'm not gonna like this. I can't. Like I can't I, I can't <laughs> help it. I, I always like the dog a detective, especially if he's doing the right thing. If the dog yeah. detective is being a douchebag and doing the wrong screw that guy. Yeah. But like the yes, Richa. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't let the do. <laughs> They're not the boss of you. I mean, maybe they are, but ignore it anyway. But still. <laughs> <laughs> Throw the rules like ask for ask for forgiveness, not permission. So yeah, that is definitely him. <laughs> and everything just kind of like you got the slow burn of as the characters build, and we we mm -hmm. build a relationship between the characters, and you know they learn a little thing here about the mystery, and then they learn a little thing here, and Quill would love to learn more, and then they start learning stuff that is tangentially related to the mystery, but very very important on a larger scale. And then things hit. I remember the percentage I was in with my Kindle when, mm -hmm. and, and I haven't, I, I didn't say it in my review either because then people will be waiting for like the. Yeah, then they'll know. <laughs> but I remember the, percent, the percentage I was at in my Kindle where I was like, oh, I guess we're off to the races then. And it didn't stop till the, I'm like, <laughs> I kept trying to find a good place to stop. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I, I gotta stop reading this. I need to, I have other things I need to do today. I read that. I read that last percentage uh, section uh, pretty much in one sitting because all of the things. <laughs> like, this is this is. I think a, it is a story structure that I I tend to do. It's a lot of like I'm going to lay out all the pieces and you're going to pick up the pieces, and when the pieces are all on the board, then it's time to go. Um, and you know, I, I I like I said, I enjoy a puzzle. And so uh, it is, it is not like, like that, that sort of slow burn is like, it's the going up the roller coaster. <laughs> it's like, everybody pay attention, look ahead, see where the loops are. Uh, and hopefully you do. <laughs> but I like, I like that. I like hearing that. I like, I, you know, there, I, it, oh, I like it. And also there's that piece of where it's like, um, you know, I, I wrote, 
my biggest book is one called fire in the blood and it's like 200,000 words. It's a chonky, chonky girl. Uh, and, uh, someone told me they, they sat down and they read it in like 12 hours. And I was like, Oh, all that work. <laughs> like on the one hand, yay, you were so engaged, oh but also gosh. you guys know how much work I put into that. I don't even know how you do that. Is that one of the, um, the, uh, Brimstone Angel books? Yeah, that's book four. How many pages is that? Uh, I don't have a copy out here, unfortunately. A lot. Uh, it yeah, it's um, that is the point. Well, the adversary got kind of big, and that was sort of <coughs> the beginning of the point where it pivots more from sword and sorcery into epic fantasy. Like the problems expand, and um, but yeah, I, and. I, I mean, I love that book, and I think I think it earns those two hundred thousand words. But but yeah, it's um, it's a lot. So I also saw that that Farida joins up with the, with does something for the Harpers. I love the Harpers. Yeah, there's Harpers. I read uh, I read all the Harpers <laughs> books. I love the Harpers books. <laughs> These are sort of so yeah. And uh, when I was writing the it, it was sort of fourth edition and then into fifth edition so at fourth edition the harpers are sort of um a little bit scattered and 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 uh no. having to so so the thing though is like when i wrote the second book lesser evils or brimstone angels lesser evils if you have trouble finding us that's not titles that you can't search on google are the worst <laughs> and lesser evils is the worst of my titles for that reason it's just, especially in an election year, it's awful. Um, but the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, that one was, some, was originally meant to be tied into a, a, an event that was called Rise of the Jintarum, which is the Jintarum are sort of like, like the mafia yeah. in, in the setting. And the Harpers was kind of the other part of it. So that's where the Harpers come in. And it is meant to be sort of like a reestablishment of the Harpers because the way they'd been described is very like scattered and, and trying to sort of pick up the pieces. So I was like, okay, they're going to pick up the pieces now. So uh, my Harpers gentle, are like- Gentle Keep still in fourth edition? Gentle, what? Gentle Keep where the Zentarum are? I think they are, yeah. The Zentarum are, uh, they, I know they they have sort of, they have, let's <laughs> get nerd out for a minute. Um, oh, the Zentarum in fourth edition had uh, sort of a schism uh, so they were sort of uh, infiltrated. They were originally kind of running under the Church of Bane, who's like a yeah. god of yeah tyrants and stuff. And then the Syracist infiltrated. And Syrix the worst. He's just a god of like Syrix. Syrix a douche. I read. Yeah. I read. I read. <laughs> I read Syrix Prince of Lies. I read Crucible. Like yep. I hated Syrix. Hated him. Hated him when he was a person. He's like, he is a god. He's just a troll. He's, he's just, just there like, to make trouble. Just yeah. Douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so they the the, the I believe Gentle Keep's still in place. I know there's Jantarum had a um kind of a, a stronghold in Westgate. And uh they yeah, and by fifth edition they brought a lot of stuff back. So I'm pretty sure like Manchun and all that stuff was still going. But I mean Manchun had eight million clones, so he was never going to be gone. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Man, nerding out on D&D &D lore. Most of, my, <laughs> most of my lore stuff I know from second edition, that's the one I played the longest. Yeah. Um, I like I like fifth because it's like it's like second edition but you can't die in one round. Um <laughs> Like that nothing. is it is actually surprisingly hard to have a character die in fifth edition. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's, no save, well. there's no save versus death or die. Like right, there's that. Yeah. It's <laughs> just like there's a lot of opportunities to turn it back. Yeah. Uh which I'm generally for because I definitely okay get it. in. I get in with for the role playing. And if Same. I'm gonna die on a stupid die roll that has no narrative impact, I'm gonna be mad about it. For sure. Give for me sure. a glorious, meaningful death. Well, and, and, and as a DM, when you're trying to when you're trying to craft a like a story that connects these people, like when they die, it's like, well, like how am I gonna I gotta get some I gotta get some new schmuck in and tie him in with the story somehow? Like, yeah. what if y'all stop making bad decisions and stop dying? <laughs> so, like, I'm gonna make 
God step down, <laughs> hit you on the not dead with a not dead stick, and we're gonna try this again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stand up, make better choices. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Where are we? Why are we talking about the Gentarum and the Harpers? Oh, we're talking about two hundred thousand words. So yeah. in your longest book, two hundred thousand words. Yep, yep. But why were you talking about that? I don't know. So, I know this is sorry. This is what happens to me. Um, That's okay. I do it too. The I have it. Thing. We were talking about Risa. And, oh, we're talking about the roller coaster. The the story structure. Yeah. And oh yeah, and the, the, someone read someone read the whole Somebody thing. Read it just right overnight. Yeah, and you're like, like, oh well. I mean, thanks, but I worked on like. Let's do it again. Two years. <laughs> Stick to the god down with the you didn't read it stick, and we're gonna try this over again. Yes, exactly. And this time, <laughs> make better choices. Read, don't read it so fast. Who Ooh. else is there? Um. So what did I want to? I need to talk about here. Okay. So my my friend Angela, I made her read it because I always make her read stuff. I'm like Angela, read this. And so she read. It. She also really liked it. And so I said, I Angela, that. thank you, Angela. Give me some questions that you want me to ask me, Aaron. Okay. Um. So she wants to know. How your experience writing D and D books helped with this, if at all? Um, well, it helped a lot because uh, if you do anything enough times, you get better at it. That for starters, um, and I think it helped a lot in the sense that, like, I really took the the to writing D and D books. Um, you're, there's a certain amount you're giving an experience, right? You want people to be reminded of the game, mm -hmm. but you also want to give them a good story. And so you're trying to kind of balance these things. And so what it ends up made, what I feel like it ended up making me good at is, um, grounding things that were absolutely ungrounded, <laughs> um, and, sure. and being able to pull together like, like weird magic and, and make it feel like something that you, you were just settled in. This was just how it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I mean, like I said, a lot of D and D world building is cool. It sounds cool, uh, and that's totally fine at the table, especially. Mm -hmm. But um, for a novel, like you have to kind of make it easier to buy into because you don't want to be distracted by like, wait, why do they fly on giant bats? Is that does because, that make any sense? Because it's because cool. it's cool, right? Yeah. Um, and the uh. Sorry, I, one of my favorite Twitter threads that I've had before all this, I will definitely say these these world building ones have been my favorite, uh, was a rundown of how, uh, so the dragonborn city of Jared Thymar is a big pyramid and their, uh, their army, their defensive force, the lance defenders ride on giant bats and the bats roost in the top of the pyramid. And this has always bothered me because do you have any idea how much poop bats make? And and where is that poop going to go? And so I posited a uh, that that the arrival of the Dragonborn in Forgotten Realms absolutely disrupted the magical components industry uh, because guano is the main ingredient for Fireball, yeah. and that they better have like a whole cohort of the army that's just Fireball specialists <laughs> because they have endless guano. Um, th that's oh, the kind of stuff I get distracted by. Um, so that's. <laughs> That's one thing. Uh, and there is that sort of like, how do you, you know, you want to keep it, keep it going, keep it fun. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the Brimstone Angel saga in particular, uh, I mean, God catch her too, but that was, there's a little bit of, that was my first novel. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, they were just, they're just, I just strove to make them good fantasy books. Um, and, and so that I think, you know, having the opportunity to write them and write them quick, um, and that's the yeah, kind of the opposite thing is that writing for D and D writing tie in is generally very fast. Uh, so my experience was usually like I would uh, pitch a book and it would be in my hands within a year, maybe 14 months. Uh, wow. It is a lot slower. <laughs> and so the, the, the metaphor I was used is I, I knew a guy in college who, uh, I think I dropped you. I don't know if this is still recording. But everybody can see and hear me, so I guess it's still recording. Uh, so I'll tell the story about Rennie. Rennie lived in Trinidad, I think. And he, the first time he came to the mainland, to U.S., he, there you are! Don't worry, I think my internet just, like, I figured. blew itself up. But as long as, as long as you were there, go I was. Sorry, it still said live. Cool. Uh, so, so this guy in college, Rennie, Rennie lived in the Caribbean. He, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's from Trinidad, but every time I say that, I'm like, do you remember this correctly? 
But he came to college in Texas, so he flew to Texas. He His uncle picked him up and they started driving. And after 45 minutes, he had a panic attack because you cannot drive that far on the island he grew up in. At that point, you're in the ocean. Ooh. And so that was sort of my experience of this book was, you know, after a year passed, I was like, okay, it's done. This isn't happening because the book should be in my hands at this point. Yeah. And I had to keep telling myself, that's not how this works anymore. Gotcha. <laughs> so... It's much slower with like much slower, out, yeah. Outside. Especially, especially for like a first book, right? Because you you have to finish it, and then you query an agent, and the agent wants rewrites, and then the submission process happens, and then we have to do the contract arguing. And blah, 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 blah. I, like, I honestly don't know what's wrong with my ability to discern details. I literally just saw that the map is behind Empire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do have it on there. I have looked at that cover for like since since it, like it was announced that it was an upcoming book. Mm -hmm. it, I've, That's so I funny. Swear, moments ago, it was beige <laughs> parchment. That map was not like, moments ago. It disappeared. I don't know how. I don't know how I didn't see that. Well, <laughs> that map is in fact there behind. Them. Whatever. <laughs> did you did you always want to be a writer? No, uh, actually, well, so the the story my mother tells is that she always knew I was going to be a writer, though, like, I wrote my first book when I was three, and so for a lot of my childhood, I was like, ugh, because I did not want to do that. I wanted to be an artist, uh, or maybe an actress, briefly a lawyer, because you could get paid to argue, and that sounded great, uh, and then, um, I guess when I was... And when I was in middle school, I started drawing art that I kind of had stories behind. And so I was like kind of like imagining this story, but I did not really write it down. Uh, and then I like hit high school and I read a book that I really hated. It was like the first time I'd ever read a book and gone, this is not, this is not good. Was it uh, why? No, uh, it was actually so. It, and I, I want to be clear because I, I, I don't know anything about this book other than when I was 14, I was angry at it. I, I haven't read it since. It was Stargate tie in because I was very into uh, Egyptian mythology. And this was like, I, if it wasn't the first it, Hathor, it was like an early, it was, it was the first time I had encountered Hathor. Yeah. And that was my favorite goddess uh like to the point like in college i wrote a paper on like early dynastic depictions of the goddess hathor like she's fascinating but i was so mad at it's how so she got depicted that i just threw the book and i didn't finish it and i wrote my very first book which was terrible egyptian mythology fan fiction but i really liked writing it and so then i like you know and th the other part of it was at that point i was in a a class where we had to do a semester project and I had not, I just was more interested in writing my book. So at some point, my mother emailed my teacher and was like, would a novel count for this? <laughs> and she's like, as long as it has themes of self-identity, yes. Nice. So I, I turned it in and, and, and my teacher was like, wow, you wrote a book. And I was like, I did a thing that was kind of cool. I liked doing it. People are impressed. I have to do another semester project. I will be writing another book. Nice. Uh, so I, yeah, I just, I, it's one of those things too, where like, even all those times I was like, no, ew, no, I don't want to be a writer. I was doing all these things that were adjacent to it. I was like reading voraciously. I was drawing pictures of characters and like making up stories about them. Um, and yeah. And then I just, something that, that book that made me mad tipped me over into like actually trying it for myself and realizing I liked it. Um, and then, you know, I kept doing it for many years before I went, wait, I, I might not be good at this. Uh, and so I started <laughs> taking, you know, took some classes, read, read up on some stuff, honed the craft a little. Um, and yeah, that, then and in getting past I, I find for a lot of writers getting past that point like once you realize actually I suck at this mm -hmm. uh and I have to actively learn to get better at it mm -hmm. um it's a big big hurdle to get past but it's nice once you do what's your well actually hold on before I ask that yeah where did you take a class did you take a bunch of classes on your like encyclopedic knowledge of like these historical civilizations 
I mean, sure. yes and no. I this is just like well, I just think it's interesting. I yeah. just read things. Um, I like I really like history. I really I I have a degree in anthropology. Uh, although wow. honestly, honestly, most of my coursework was in physical anthropology. Oh, okay. Because uh, I just bones are really interesting. Um, <laughs> but but you know, I I just have always been interested in it and and linguistics. I am I joke I'm a linguistic magpie because I I love learning about languages, but I have the barest retention for actually learning them. So I can tell you uh, about like weird features of Nahuatl, but I cannot tell you how to say anything in Nahuatl. <laughs> That is so freaking cool. I'm I'm reading this historical like you're I'm reading your 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 world building threads, mm -hmm. and I'm like I have general knowledge of these things that she's talking about, but I have no specialization in like I'm like where are the well you know and where are the Greeks yeah. the I can just look at any fantasy book, but I'm just like where are the like my Greece, Rome, Persia. That's what I got. And then I got yeah. to Persia and, and Byzantium. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm on solid ground again. I know, <laughs> I, know this, I know this stuff. I was just like, man, how do you know all this stuff about these things? <laughs> and, yet, and yet I can't tell north from south frequently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, can't, you can't have all that. I grew up in St. Louis and I, I well, like in the suburbs of St. Louis and, uh, and I, I always knew East was where the water was. And then I moved to Seattle and the water's on the wrong side. Yeah, and well, for the first, cool. yeah. yeah, first couple of months, I was like, I definitely drove the wrong direction for quite a while before I realized the oh. water is on the, uh, on the other side. <laughs> you're not going where you think you're going. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, crap. Now for another question. No, no, I asked the wrong question first. Oh, no. I forgot the other one. It was no, hold on. You were you did you was, want to be an author? Um blah, 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 blah. You were saying what was your I thought you were saying what was your favorite before you said that. Probably. I'll get there. I'll find I'll find my way back. Um you start listing favorite things. Yeah, so what was your favorite? Well, I'm just gonna ask. <laughs> um I'm gonna I'll, hopefully my question will come back. I'm gonna ask my my Angela questions again. What was your favorite what what was your favorite part of writing this book and what's the hardest part of writing this book? Oof. Um, my favorite part of writing this book, I think are the character, like character interactions. Like there's, you know, there's several moments in particular, like especially Amadea with someone who's spiraling is a big one. Um, and I love writing. I love writing like realizations and, and revelations for characters, which is nice when you're writing a mystery because those mm -hmm. come up. Um, the worst part, the hardest part, not the worst, the hardest part, um, I think is, you know, lining up, lining up those, those revelations and lining up the clues in a way, uh, that, that unfolds nicely. And also just sort of, you know, you work on something enough and everything feels so obvious, like, it's and it's worse. It's like worse with a mystery because you're like everybody's gonna know exactly. Everybody's gonna know everything that's going on, and I, and I, which like at the same time, you know. I and I saw someone mention this on Twitter the other day, and I'm like, yes, I'm gonna remind myself that. Like, there is something there. There is a balance there, right? I you don't like reading something when you know right off the bat what's gonna happen, and the author keeps going, "What's gonna happen?" And you're like, everybody think faster. That drives me nuts. But also yeah. when you figure it out and then you see it play out, there is something rewarding about that. Like mm -hmm. I paid attention and I get, I get to feel smart for it. Um, and that's sort of a tricky balance with a, uh, with a mystery. Cause you don't, yeah, you don't want people to be impatient with you to tell them the, that they're mm -hmm. correct. Um, hopefully there's enough other stuff going on that it's okay yeah. that if you do, um, but uh but yeah, I think making sure all those pieces come out. And there's also just there. I, I re, Richa gives me trouble sometimes. <laughs> Coming with, uh, with the party. Um, it's, I mean, that's got to be really like, because you have no distance from it. Like, you know what the answer to the mystery is. Oh, yeah. So it's got to be really difficult to, to know whether or not, like, I don't even know how you gauge, like, did I hide it too well? Because yeah. on the other side, you don't want it to like the mystery to be revealed and be like, well, there's no way I could have known that. Right. That's not a good feeling either. That just like, like when you, 
Yeah, when books set things up and it's like, ha ha, like, I feel like I've been, people, people don't like to be tricked, they like to be surprised. Yeah. Um, and I don't, yeah. Um, the answer is I have a lot of, uh, I have a really great writing group uh, oh, with, fantastic. you know, a, a nice range of, like, how experienced are you with mysteries? So, you know, the people who are less uh, can tell me this was confused, you know, where was it confusing? Where was I not picking up the clues? And the people who are more can say, this is where I figured it out. Um, and, and kind of finding, finding a nice balance for that. Um, and, and yeah. And then that, that other part is like, it should be, there's, there's, there should be, this is also the nice thing about, you know, blending genres is there's enough going on here where if the mystery is not your favorite part, there's other things happening, right? There's the cool world building and there's the found family <laughs> stuff and there's the, you know, like just, other things to other things to be delighted by so mm -hmm. for sure um so what is your i, I remember the question i wrote it down okay um, what is what is your writing process like like do you write it like do you write like scattered scenes do you write it like all sequentially do you oh. sit down and say i'm gonna write i'm gonna write two hundred thousand words in 12 hours for that oh my god that, i wish for that <laughs> man you know i am for 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 years like uh, there are definitely people who are in tie-in because they can do it really fast. Mm -hmm. They can do what's asked for and they can do it really fast. And so I know these guys who are like, I sneezed a book out in two weeks and I'm like, I don't even know. I don't even know how you do that. So for years I thought, oh, I'm a really slow writer. And then I realized like, no, it's not a weird thing for to take five years to write a book. Yeah. And I'm like, it took me like six whole months. <laughs> like that's, that's actually real fast um two weeks is obscene two weeks that's is obscene, obscene. right that's it's obscene. bananas that's... i don't know two guys who write that fast and i don't get it um <laughs> oh like, my gosh that is not me that will never be me um but i've forgotten your question i'm so sorry oh, what's my writing process like yeah. <laughs> um right. so i like to write sequentially generally um because if i don't i i it, it i i kind of try to there's so i love writing multi-point of view i like mm -hmm. that sort of juxtaposition of relationships and that sort of web that it creates. And part of that means that I sort of have to have the scenes come down in order so that I can see like how that, that, that energy for lack of a better word is flowing between the scenes. And so sometimes I will jump ahead and write something if I'm trying to figure out like, where am I heading? Is it going like, how do I make sure that the tones all going to fit as it comes down? But mostly I just do it sequentially. Um, I, uh, I have kind of like limited writing time and I try to really stick to it, mm -hmm. uh, which is not always possible. I have two, they're not, you know, the older ones starting to be not small. So I shouldn't say I have two small children, um, but I have two younger children. Right. And uh, so they, they definitely, you know, need things. <laughs> yeah. And I also uh, I write dialogue for a video game. Um, so I have kind of like a part-time job and I have a writing job and I have parenting. And so that sort of afternoon time is, is when I write, um i work honestly with but which is hard because i honestly work best like right at dinner time which is why i love writing retreats because i can just like go and i don't have to do anything for yeah. the golden hours and i can just do it um yeah and i i usually i try to work by word count i am not gonna write you know like i like I, once i think i wrote nine thousand words in a day and i feel like i broke my brain um it, wow. Yeah, like there's you can get in the zone. There's definitely been times I've hit the zone and I'm like, oh, I made a lot of words happen. But mostly it's not quite that much. It's still decent, right? I still get a chunk done. Um, and I, yeah, so that that like making a point of doing it every day so that it so that it finally gets done. But I'm also someone who um, I kind of tend to iterate a little bit. So like I'll write a thing and then I'll be like, that was wrong. Um, I have to figure out like what went off here. Uh, so like I, I, uh, I have a writing podcast as well. And one of my co-hosts is like a diehard outliner. E. Dave is like outlines everything. Mm -hmm. He's a big fan of like save the cat for structure and stuff. And so I feel like I always make him itch when I'm like, yeah, I outline, but I realize the outline's wrong because, because I find often that like, as I'm kind of figuring out who these characters are and what's their problem and like, how is this gonna affect them and how are they gonna change? Like it becomes this dynamic thing. So there are definitely times where I go, oh, this is not your scene. 
uh, this is somebody else's scene or like, oh, actually you're not sort of ready to have this conversation. This was like a big thing for Relics of Ruin, like working on it, realizing like these, you know, as these sort of character arcs and like where people are in their, in their sort of figuring out their shit kind of journey. Uh, hopefully I can say that. Sorry. You're fine. Um, <laughs> I forgot to ask in the beginning of this, what's your cursing feelings? You're fine. Um, that, you know, that, that they're not quite lining up. So you have to kind of unpick it all and do it again. Um, but that's, that's sort of how I get there. Um, so I find it, yeah, as much as possible, like just sink in, be in the space and, and work it through. I gotcha. Um, what video game do you write for? Because you said that and people are going to yeah. be like, what video game do you write That's for? That's fair. Well, so I write for a game called Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms, um, which, I'm like, I should flash something, but all I have is this, like, dice vault. Da, 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 da. Um, it's an idle game, right? So it's, it is one that you can, I mean, it's, like, idle, but you can also, like, kind of do things with it um you have it's kind of based in D D. you have all these characters that come from what's the what's the thing that I, I i did an actual play and they were one of our sponsors it's like novels campaigns and popular shows into one epic adventure um so you can like you know you can send uh out you know drits from the 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 drits novels and um you know, people, characters from popular actual play shows, uh, and and NPCs from uh, different campaigns, and and put them in like a little formation, and they march across the screen, and then these little, these monsters will march across the screen, and you know, you have an area that's like, okay, fight twenty five monsters. Um, to go with this, there is a story, uh, which is like the dialogue between the characters, and this is what I write. So it is something where it's not like playing like dragon age where the dialogue is like an integral part of your experience um I but i but <laughs> it's good right but i like i don't know it's in i think it's a fun place it, it's is where i gotta be funny um so i try to do it very humorous and like whenever possible try to make something new happen in the game um so that if you like you don't have to it's a game you can kind of set it up and let it run mm -hmm. um but it does sort of reward you tinkering with this. So if you're going to tinker, like I, I want to give you something else to do. So this is where, uh, I, I don't remember if it was before we were talking and I said that I made douchebag I Vecna. Did. Yeah. I, I, like I was literally thinking about that. I'm like, we already mentioned Vecna and douchebag douche Vecna. Vecna. Yeah. But that was says, on. Every time he me. leaves, he goes Vecna out. And I don't know why, but I find that really. Did that's you really, write that? Yeah. That's, okay. that's, <laughs> that's like, that's the personality, but it's, you know, it is kind of modern and weird. If Vecna was, if Vecna went to my, went to my high school, that's literally what he would say. <laughs> right. Vecna out. Right. Like, like, it's just, I, you know, and I it's fun. <laughs> so much. And, um, speaking of Dritz, R.A. Salvatore bought your book. He Do you did. know R.A. Salvatore? Yeah. <laughs> what'd you say is he nice he's he's very nice I, you know what's really funny um so i found so i wrote a book called the adversary which is the crisis crossover yeah. On, the and yeah the sundering which is like it was me they picked me out of the fourth edition authors to add and then it was a bunch of like you know legendary folks like ed greenwood and troy dunning and ari salvatore and ari uh, richard lee byers like like all these guys are new york times bestsellers and then there's me and and so we had the first story summit and i was like really nervous um especially because you know bob's huge uh and he's he i just i always kind of was a little nervous around him and and they were all so nice they were just like having like suddenly five great uncles like <laughs> five awesome uncles they are not that much older those than me. names just like blast from the past right? to me. like oh right? my gosh and I've, I've read more salvatore novels than anybody except maybe terry pratchett because I think, <laughs> read, I think i've read more discworld books but like he has to like it's got to be close i've read yeah. so many like he was my author when i was when yeah. i was younger i read everything he wrote I, like have you read his cleric quintet no yeah. one ever talks about Cleric Quintet. We'll be back to it that way. 
But it, like at the end of this, I went up to him, you know, like he's waiting for his cow. And I said, you know, thank you. Thank you so much. You've been so so nice. Like, it's like, it's like, you're actually like one of the nicest people I've ever met. And he's like, don't tell anybody, <laughs> which is, is exactly his kind of humor. He's actually hilarious. And he's really kind. And he is like, you know, of, of all the authors I know, like he is one of the best to his fans like he he really cares that's awesome about um but not and and not like in a weird like bleedy kind of way but he but he you know if he has a signing um you know bob's gonna be late after a signing because he will stay there till the line's gone that's really cool. and that and the line is huge um i i can imagine yeah um, i was i was <laughs> I was really, I was really glad because I know he blur. I mean, he doesn't. It's not like he never blurbs, but I know he's really busy. So I was like, you know, if you could, I'd really appreciate it. And he was like, I don't know if I'm gonna have time, yeah. but if nothing else, I'll tell them, you know, that I think you're a great author because he has read from Stone Angels. Um, and then he was doing an AMA, and he, he, I think he texted me and he said, I'm like, I'm doing AMA, and I look. I, I called out your book and I looked and I was like, are you actually, do you actually have time to read it? He's like, oh yeah, it's really great. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and it's a real blurb. It's not like it's my real one. friends and I, like, like Germ, like George R. R. Martin has like fantasy as it ought to be written on like every single book. It's like a like, <laughs> on there. <laughs> so I was like, I don't even know how many he's read, but like, that's an actual, like, real, that's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, it was that's really, really, really wonderful. I was, I, and it's one of those moments too because like you know like i know i know he's a he's a really well-known author um i've been on panels with him and he actually has like really interesting things to say about craft and and uh, he's just a great guy um but like i saw that blurb and i was like oh my god the creator of grits blurred my book <laughs> like it was a different thing it wasn't like bob it was like r.a salvador um that's the nice feeling like because I also know he would not lie. Yeah. <laughs> he's definitely, he's definitely, like, I, you know, like, there's, I definitely, um, I like, like, Ed Greenwood also blurbed it. Uh, and I would, I would, and, I, and I'm grateful and he was very kind about it. But I also feel a little like Ed wouldn't be mean. Um, but I also know Bob wouldn't tell me it, that he really liked it. If yeah. he didn't like it, he would just be like, I'm busy. So. That, that really... exactly he's got a, he's got an out like he didn't he wouldn't even have to tell you oh yeah yeah, yeah. that's true <laughs> all right so two more questions okay at the end of empire bags i'm not gonna talk about the end but okay it ends it does not end where i anticipated it ending because remember the last x percent is very much like oh man what like oh there's more oh oh there's more oh oh there's more oh oh there's more after that it ends and i'm like where is this gonna go like what can, <laughs> what can you tell us non-spoilery about the the about where the the, the second book is going to go okay like, well uh relics of ruin it, it's another mystery um yes like is it intense. really yeah yeah yes. like that is that is definitely what I want out of these books, and so and so it's a it's another mystery, um, but at the same time they are trying to figure out you know what are the sort of bigger implications of of what happens in Empire of Exiles, um, so it's it is sort of still trying to it's try, I'm trying to merge that epic and mystery thing. Um, it adds Tanook as a point of view character. Does it really? Yeah. He's so grouchy. I, I love like him. him. You can he's... find out why he's so grouchy. Oh, yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> he's so grouchy. He can't yeah. be bothered. He can't be bothered. Like, y'all need to just leave him alone. I, <laughs> I love to, what I loved about writing Tanook is that, you know, he seems like someone who hates everybody, but you can kind of tell that, like, he really needs people, but he doesn't know how to ask for it. Um, so I liked being able to kind of unpack that more. So like he's still still really grouchy, but uh, yeah, I, I like him. <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah, and so let's see. Is that I think that's the main thing. You get more Richa. You get much more of Richa's backstory, and like that's exciting too. 
Yeah. Are we still have the uh, same. Are, are we losing any POVs? We still have the same ones from this one. With I kept the same. Well, here's the thing. I will say is that I'm still finishing it, so oh. there is a possibility my editor will look and go cut that. Um, so I don't want to promise anything because uh, uh, obviously Bradley is a genius and will give, steer me correctly. And so, but uh, but I also don't know how you would cut any of these and make it work. So I feel like they're all gonna stick. Uh, it's all the same ones plus Tanook. Very cool. That's exciting. I'm so. And the excited. framing, the the so so this one has the framing story with Tehran and Rodolfo. Um, Relics of Ruin has a different framing story that uh, we won't get into too much because it would be maybe a little spoilery. I gotcha. I'm. Well, tell me once we go off the air because I got. Okay. I have to know. I'm actually that's, curious if it's in the. That's. I don't. I don't remember what I gave them. And, and oh, I did. Okay. The, the first part of the framing story is in the sample chapter at the end of the book. So people will go get it. You can find out. Don't have <laughs> Amazon's going to wait forever to send it to me. <laughs> I'm going to be the last one to get it. Um, <laughs> okay. So that's, that's and, and Relics of Ruin is out, you said, December of 2022. I, I think so. Or it's next. No, 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 no. Wait. <laughs> you can't just throw numbers at me. <laughs> it's next year. Sometime next year. Oh, I thought uh, it was next month. <laughs> oh, dang it. Dang. I'm so excited. Okay, and last question. This is for my friend yeah. Angela. What's something you wish people would ask you about on these things? What is something I wish people Because you know you're gonna get asked, about. you're gonna ask the same questions over and over again. I know. Yeah. Is there something that you wish people would ask that no one ever asked? No, but here's here's the, the dumb thing that pops in my head is the story of Bjorni. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't, I, I, so we chatted before and I actually don't remember when, what we said that was before and what we said that. I don't remember live. either. But. Um, if we're repeating yeah. it, we'll go with it. So one of the, one of the anthropology classes I took was zooarchaeology, which is about, you know, studying animal bones in the context of human uh, uh, settlements and remains and what can you learn from them, right? And so part of this was we had to draw a lot of bones um so really? have this notebook yeah like uh yeah like a lot and then you had to mark all the features uh so you, you know what you're looking at so i'm pretty good at identifying skulls now um awesome. but my favorite are rabbit skulls uh so <laughs> rabbit skulls are we did talk about this on the stream briefly okay so rabbit skulls are i are are really cool because they have what's called a lacy maxilla they have these things called fen i think they're fenestrations late here i'm sorry but there's this the bone is like all kind of open and and kind of there's this crisscross work and they're weird looking and they're kind of creepy um and so like i just love them i think they're so interesting and so for years i have been trying to figure out a way to put a rabbit skull in a book and it has never worked uh so there's a a, a thing in here that's a it's a giant horned rabbit skull so it's different a little but uh that tanook carries around and and he named it bjorni uh and and like i said my uh my discord for my actual play show found out about it and they got very delighted by bjorni so i actually actually i forgot i'm wearing the shirt <laughs> you have a bjorni shirt i made a bjorni shirt Here. so i made these for the, this is in the these stickers are in the um oh that's in the, the pre-order swag too? that's the pre-order swag so this is actually the rabbit skull i drew in college uh inked and colored and i added horns and some text and a leaf um so those are in the pre-order swag and then i found out canva will print t-shirts so I, I made myself this bjarni shirt <laughs> That's awesome. I love this stupid rabbit skull so much. But that's the story of it. Is that, yeah, I, I spent a lot of loving time drawing a rabbit skull and being really fascinated by uh, the, the, the structure of the maxilla. Uh, and and I've been trying to figure out what's it for for the mumble mumble years since. And, <laughs> and this is the, apparently the answer is uh, I made goofy book swag. <laughs> Does the next day I call him Bjorni? Is that what it says called? I call him Bjorni. Yeah. That's awesome. So That's yeah, awesome. if you would like to pre, if you would uh, pre order, if you want to pre order, you should pre order. If you pre order Empire of Exiles, um, on my Twitter account, at the, pinned at the top is the 
swag thing. So tell me you did it, and I'll send you these stickers of this stupid rabbit skull. <laughs> but and the and the um and the, the art cards, cards. yeah, the art and cards. the bookmark. Is and uh, do you have do you have do you have copies of those map of that map? I don't. You should get copies. I of those don't. I do. I, she. I know. And Francesca sells the originals, and I'm so not. Sometimes I don't know if she sells all of them, but I'm very tempted. But they're very expensive, right. and I'm. Yeah, I'm they're just. Fine. I mean, it's a lot of work, right? Yeah. Um, I'm I'd pretty one, sure she. I'm. I'm not positive, but I think she like watercolors them. I'm not positive. Like they're. I mean, it's. It is. It is artistry. Yeah, so I, I, I it is a gorgeous map. I definitely you're gonna have a bunch of people I, buy this book just on a map. They're gonna look at that map. <laughs> and gonna have it. Sorry, I gotta have yeah. it. All these book nerds. <laughs> They're like, forget about the guts. Just give me the map. Well, I yeah, like. I think, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say I also really love like on the map. You know, sh sh it's it's um it's got like illustrations around the outside that are the that kind of are part of the story. Yes, it zooms um, in on your 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 world building threads. Zoom in on that. Yeah, and the uh, yeah the both there's two actually it has two maps because it has the world map and then it has just the Samilla map and and they're gorgeous. That's that's awesome. I will see all of that when when yeah. in 2023 Amazon finally sends me my copy. <laughs> 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 back in August or whatever. Aaron, thank you so much. <laughs> thank for you for having me. Joining me. Everyone, this has been Aaron M. Evans. Go pre-order guys, go pre-order Empire Exiles. Just do it. Like do it. Pre-orders are so important for for uh authors that aren't R.A. Salvatore. <laughs> you have to pre-order anything. There's gonna be another Drift book. So just you know, he's gonna sell a hundred million. Um so go pre-order this. It's good. Go pre get that map for real, and then <laughs> and then put your thing in the in the. It, I'll link everything down yeah. down below, and That's then you cool. can go get that pre-order swag and read it, and come talk to, come talk to us about it because we didn't talk about any spoilers here. So hopefully you should hear it at the no. end and talk about it and then tell everybody because this is good. Like there's a lot of fantasy that comes out and a lot of it. I mean. Love is fine, but there's a lot of like samey stuff. This is different. And that is what um, really appealed to me is the fact that, like you said, what if like what if the scholars, what if the people looking for answers were were the main characters instead of like, the, <laughs> hey, librarian, we need to know where this came from so we can go. <laughs> um, it's it's really good. It's really good. Thank so you. thank you so much for being here. Um, and yeah. Thank you everybody for watching and you know talk in the comments below and and then go go find Aaron on Twitter and w read those world building threads and be like how do you know all this stuff so <laughs> anyway so bye guys and I'm going to end the broadcast and then I'm going to tell you about that scene I'm talking about I want to hear it okay